Okay, we've got, uh, this is the Boston Linux and Unix user group meeting for December 21st, 2022. Uh, this will be the last meeting of the year. And today we're gonna have uh, Shankar Viswanathan to present home router and firewall using OpenSense. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. Yeah, so this this um, talk is about you know using OpenSense to set up your own uh, home router slash you know firewall, and um, kind of what I wanted to talk about today was to um, go over um, you know sort of the motivations for this new home network. So I completely revamped my network. Uh, kind of what was the motivation for that? Um, some of the hardware and software choices that I looked at. Um, then we can go into some of the open sense uh, basics, um, uh, how I set up the router and overall network, uh, look at some power performance metrics. And finally, you know, if you have some time, I can, I can do a demo of um, open sense um, running uh, within a VM. So um, um, let's see how much time we have. <clears throat> so, um, so kind of motivation for, 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 uh, you know, why I, I went this route, um, basically what I had, you know, maybe this is about a year ago. Um, so somebody seeing blank screen or is it visible? I can see everything. Yes, as well. Okay. Um, so basically, um, what I had uh, was like a typical consumer router. Um, it was like a TP-Link of some sort um, running um, open word. And this was um, in my basement here. Like, so I live in a two-family um, unit. Um, and uh, this router was, you know, we have a finished part of the basement and then another floor. So this router was in the basement and um, I had... Uh, coax um, uh, between the basement and the first floor and uh, put, you know, mocha adapters on, on each side. And then the, and so that the, you know, I needed the mocha adapter because the Wi-Fi was very poor. Um, and uh, the mocha adapter kind of sat under our TV because, um, you know, um, the, the game console and other stuff needed ethernet. Uh, and so this this uh, adapter had blinking lights, which you know I was fine with, but um, others in the family weren't so thrilled about. So this is this is this is what I had, um, and like I said, it kind of worked, uh, but um, performance was poor in some rooms, um, and which we later found out, you know, we have a, a, a Latin plaster um, walls. And uh, we later found out <laughs> that there were some, uh, you know, some of these walls had chicken wire in them. And so this created a perfect Faraday cage as far as Wi-Fi signals went. Uh, and then during the peak of the pandemic, uh, when, you know, we were all working from home, school from home, everything on, on video, um, latency became bad. And I would have kids complain about, you know, their calls getting dropped and, and so forth. So um, this wasn't great. And then our ISP, you know, we, I, I, I thought it was a problem with upstream bandwidth because at that time, I think I had a lower tier. And then I went to a, a higher tier. And then I found out that I actually never could saturate the, the, this tier. So, uh, so, you know, kind of it worked, but it wasn't great. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> along with a bunch of other people, you know, we all did some home remodeling um, during this pandemic. So we, we redid uh, bathrooms in our house and we took, uh, I took advantage of that to have the contractor put down some conduit and then lay out CAT 6A cabling. Uh, and so this can do uh, up to 10 gigabits, you know, I take over distances um, less than a, less than hundred meters. So I had these wires installed, put uh, put um, uh, ports in uh, uh, in 
a uh, couple of the <laughs> couple of the uh, bedrooms and then in my little area where I'm sitting right now which is which is kind of my home office uh, so uh, I you know so this this uh, uh, was something that was just tacked on to general home remodeling so that was great uh, but then uh, what router should I stick to the old router and 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 then get another kind of access point, or should I um, go with a you know sort of a more DIY approach and and use a a, a router focused um, uh, OS? Uh, and you know sort of the title of the talk <laughs> gives the gives the thing away. Um, I decided to go with a, a more DIY approach, and kind of the reasons for that is that it's um, Less hassle. Uh, you know, a lot of these uh, consumer routers uh, are starting to lock their firmware, so it's hard to go and flash um, open WRT or any of these kinds of um, open source firmware in there. Um, and then previously, I've always had issues where I would um, buy, you know, research on the open WRT website, you know, get get a particular model. Uh, of router, and then I, you know, get it, and then it's fine. It's like a V2 instead of V3 or or something, and then you know there was it was always um, issues uh, with that, and then that meant that it had different um, uh, flash uh, memory inside the router or different amount of RAM, and this meant I could only use a certain image or something wouldn't work at all, and so you know at least this was going back a few years now, but I had to return something and get another one um, just, just to get a different model or revision number. Um, so I didn't want to deal with all that, all that weirdness. Uh, and then, you know, there's more flexibility overall. If you run it on a more, somewhat more powerful hardware, then you can do other things um, besides what can uh, fit on the sort of relatively small flash memories that these um, that these consumer routers tend to have. By the way, if you have any questions, please please stop and ask anytime. Um, so okay, so so this was uh, sort of the you know motivation for or sort of reasoning behind why I chose um, the DIY approach. Uh, <clears throat> so then, um, well, if I want to do DIY, what router OS do I use? So I kind of thought about this and, and put down a few criteria that um, I wanted the, the, the OS um, to have, right? Obviously, it needs to be secure, secure and stable, um, regular updates. This is one of the other problems with, um, with OpenWRT sometimes on these limited hardware. <clears throat> it's... it's, it's uh, um, you know, updating it is kind of more or less the same as reinstalling it from scratch. Um, so I wanted something that was, you know, relatively simpler, you know, similar to a typical Linux distro kind of, you know, update. Uh, and then something that was flexible, you know, allowed a few more things and had to be relatively um, easy to use. You know, long time ago, I, I did set up my own router with, you know, stock I think it was Slackware Linux at this, you know, this was back, I, I guess, 20 years ago. And then I had to mess with IP tables and did all of that by hand. Um, you know, that was a great learning learning experience, but with two kids and, and other responsibilities, I don't have that kind of time anymore. So I wanted something that was relatively easy to, to set up. Uh, and, and then it had to be open source and, you know, with a reasonably active community um, so that, I could um, uh, I could uh, get um, uh, you know um, support right and questions and things like this. So these were kind of the high level criteria that I had um, uh, going into this. And then in terms of more specific uh, features, um, um, I wanted something with obviously had a full featured stateful um, firewall, uh, DHCP server. Uh, VLAN support. So this is, um, you know, so that I can segment my network um, uh, a little bit better and, you know, also learn about VLANs. Um, needed WireGuard 
um, WireGuard um, VPN um, support um, so that I can uh, get to my home network um, on the go. And then a couple of optional things um, in terms of, um, you know, some, some level of DNS filtering or blacklisting and if possible, some QoS so that, you know, my kids don't hog all the bandwidth playing games while I'm in an important, you know, BLU presentation. So these were, these were some of the, some of the criteria. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, when I, when I said, when I looked into it, okay, what, what kind of um, OSs would meet some of these criteria? Um, and then there's uh, basically it came down to these five. I know there are a, a few more, uh, but these are the ones that I, um, you know, in my initial um, searches, um, these are the ones that popped up um, that seems to seem to meet most of this criteria. So there's PFSense and OpenSense. Uh, both of them are based on FreeBSD, and then uh, you know, OpenWort, IPFire, Untangle. There's also VIOS or VIOS, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, those are all, uh, again, various uh, Linux-based um, distributions. So um, I, I uh, looked um, at all of them and, um, uh, you know, I decided to go with OpenSense. Again, the title of the talk gives that away. And kind of the reason for this is, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, you know, I, all, all my devices at home um, are, are Linux based. And so um, just wanted to do something different, right? Uh, again, another opportunity to learn BSD. I've used, I've used BSD a long time ago, but haven't touched it in a long time. Um, so I thought, why not that? And then, you know, in kind of looking between, um, uh, PF sense and open sense, um, just it seemed like the community uh, behind um, open sense was uh, more than what PF sense had, and PF sense is more controlled by a, a company. Um, so um, seemed like open sense would be the the better choice. So like I said, uh, open sense is based on um, FreeBSD, uh, which is um, actually forked out of uh, PFSense. Uh, and PFSense itself is a fork of Monowall, which I think goes back almost 20 years at this point. Uh, so it has a, it has a big, uh, you know, long history. Uh, um, and uh, so the, the um, uh, OpenSense itself was uh, found, I don't know, some people are losing me. Are am I still visible, audible? No, the small tile. It says SV screen uh, shows the presentation. All it's too small to see, but you're uh, in the big one. It's just the uh, the uh, white S and the green yeah. circle and black background. Yeah, the uh, you're yeah, your online your shared screen is. Uh, Blank and it's showing that the frame rate is not applicable. Okay. And it seems to lose it. So I'd probably exit and come back. I've seen that before on okay. other people. Yeah, there's a text message now saying video for SV screen is uh, blank due to uh, work. Um, interesting. It's Ed's fault. Okay. Can I? Maybe I will freeze my video, see if that helps. Okay, can you see it now? We have a screen. Much better. Okay. All right. Well, my network needs more fixing then. Uh, bandwidth was a problem. Okay. Um, I'll go back. 
<clears throat> okay, still visible? Yep. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I was saying, um, uh, you know, so so open sense basically derives from monowall, uh, and um, uh, since it was started in about 2015, I think that's when it forked off of uh, off of uh, PF sense. Um, monowall, um, I think, ended. Um, the guy who was who was maintaining it kind of stopped in 2015, and basically endorsed. Uh, open sense as it's like a uh, spiritual, you know, successor. Uh, and so open sense itself is, is, uh, was founded and, and has since been maintained by, uh, this company called the CISO AB, which is a Dutch, um, company. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's been, it's been, um, continuously updated, uh, since then, um, it has a relatively easy to, uh, use, uh, UI. And you know, following the theme of all the BSDs, you know, it has fantastic documentation. I have the link up here, but uh, really, um, you know, the majority of the stuff that I wanted to do, I could just follow their online documentation and and do it. You know, I I did see some other tutorials and other stuff in setting it up, but really, um, um, most of the information you need to set it up and configure it is all available on the open sense um, documentation so this is very easy to use um, <clears throat> so in terms of um, the the major features um, uh, you know it has the, the firewall um, um, dns and dhcp servers support for dynamic dns um, um, I have not set it up yet, but it does uh, 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 allow two-factor authentication for any changes to be made. Uh, VLAN support, link aggregation, failover, traffic shaping, um, uh, you know, VPN. Um, and then there's a core list of packages, and there's also um, support for plugins. Some of the plugins come from the OpenSense uh, sort of maintainers themselves. And... Um, there is um, others, um, so the other ones um, uh, from like other community, you know, um, uh, maintainers. Somebody said about bridge support. I think that is there. I haven't checked. Um, <clears throat> and then you can do like um, virus scanner, um, intrusion detection, all of these things. Some of it is in the base package and other things like Clam AV you can go um, install via the the plugins so uh, it kind of it kind of met all the criteria that you know i was interested in um and so um in terms of you know installation of um open sense currently um the images are available for amd64 only um uh uh i don't I know people have been um, uh, uh, um, looking at um, uh, supporting, you know, um, at least the 64-bit ARM versions. I don't know where that is in terms of production ready, uh, but FreeBSD obviously runs on that. Uh, but uh, but the OpenSense specific bits, I don't know if um, they have all been ported over to ARM yet. Uh, OpenSense can be, you know, you can install it from, from USB um, or flash drive, um, uh, uh, you know, or, or via serial. You can do that uh, over, you have a, if you have a monitor connected, you could do that with a display, or you can just do over a serial console. Uh, you know, as with all the BSDs um, and free BSD, um, finding um, drivers that work uh, can be tricky for certain devices. Um, particularly for uh, for um, uh, you know for for a device like this you know a, a router uh, you know the NICs uh, tend to have uh, some some of the NICs tend to have issues uh, but the Intel ones are generally the the best supported um, Broadcom ones do sense to send, tend to have issues 
um, the real tech ones are somewhere in between. I think some of the older devices uh, work reasonably well, uh, but the newer ones, uh, driver support may be tricky. Uh, and um, there's a nano image that's available uh, for embedded devices. Uh, so this one doesn't um, have a writable file system. So all the writes uh, go to um, RAM disk and then the logs um, do not persist upon reboots. But if you want to install it on a, on a real, relatively small device, then you can do that. Um, so the standard file system that they recommend is ZFS. It also supports the sort of the standard um, BSD UFS file system, but I think most people ZFS. Uh, and you can install OpenSense either directly on bare metal hardware, or you could run that inside a VM. Um, and my real system runs on a bare metal, but you know the demo I, I managed to install it under KVM. Uh, so you could do it both ways. Um, and then once you once you um, um, install it, uh, the configuration. Uh, you could do it via the, the console um, CLI. Um, you could use the web GUI or, um, you know, once you enable um, the SSH daemon via the, the, the console, then you can SSH in from some other machine and, and do it, you know, and then go through the rest of the configuration process. So it's relatively, relatively straightforward. Um, the web GUI is obviously the, the most intuitive, easiest way. But if you have all the OpenSense documentation available, um, you could do most of it through the console also. Um, <clears throat> so um, in terms of what the um, OpenSense uh, developers like recommend for, for hardware, um, for most, um, you know, you, you, could, you could install it on, on, on you know, really old um, uh, Wimpy machines, but, um, you know, sort of if you want majority of those features that I talked about, if you want to enable a lot of them, then um, they recommend something um, uh, something greater than a one and a half gigahertz, um, you know, dual core or better um, CPU. So mostly anything, you know, in the last 10 years um, should work okay. Um, four gigabytes of RAM, but um, you could, if you want to enable some of the more deep packet inspection and some other things, um, you know, antivirus scanning and so forth, then you're probably better off going to eight gigabytes. Uh, then you need um, either a serial console or uh, or some kind of video uh, for, for the installation. Um, they recommend about 120 gigabytes storage um, uh, for the, uh, the OS itself and whatever logs you care to uh, save. Um, and then you need uh, two or more um, Ethernet ports. Net ports. Um, you can do it if, if on a machine, if you only have one NIC, you could do it if you have a VLAN capable, you know, managed switch. Um, so it's called a router on a stick. You can Google that. Um, basically, you get only half the, the bandwidth of your Ethernet. Uh, uh, but uh, so if you have a gigabit Ethernet NIC and you're upstream internet bandwidth is less than, you know, 500 uh, megabits, um, you should be okay. Not ideal, um, but but doable. Um, so this, this is a recommended um, hardware. And um, so I thought, okay, what, what hardware do I want to use uh, for, my, for my setup? So sort of the first idea, and I've, I've been looking at these uh, PC engines, APU boards for a while, uh, for some other uses, but it seemed like a neat uh, thing to do. And, um, you know, by some Google searches uh, did show that, you know, other people had successfully gotten it working. And so if you, if I found this um, um, kit, um, uh, which has the board and the, and the case and power supply and so forth. Um, and like I said, people have managed to load OpenSense and, and had good reviews about getting it to work. Um, and this whole thing costs about, you know, $225 for the kit. 
unfortunately, when I was looking at this, uh, this was at the height of the uh, chip shortage and, and all that last year, um, it was completely unobtainable. So all the stores online were sold out. So, um, you know, I had to move past this. Um, the other option uh, was to get these um, uh, various, you know, low power um, uh, fanless PCs, uh, mini PCs. Um, and there, you know, there's various brands uh, and you can get them from, you know, your various online retailers. Um, so there's, and then there's some by Deciso itself, which is the company behind um, OpenSense. Um, and then NetGate is the company behind PFSense. So these two companies, pro, you know, pro, uh, do their own hardware as in um, their branded uh, hardware. And then there are some other companies like Protectly and Quartom. Um, so they all have, uh, you know, uh, machines that look like the picture here. This one is from Quartom, but all these boxes look pr pretty similar. Um, they have somewhere, you know, depending on the model, um, four or six um, gigabit, you know, Ethernet ports. And if you buy um, the ones from Deciso or NetGate, they'll come with PFSense or OpenSense already preloaded. Uh, um, I could not get very clear power numbers for them, um, but generally, I think what people were saying is that it's somewhere between 15 to 35 watts, uh, depending on the model. Uh, and um, the price range um, is anywhere between 300 to $700, depending on uh, what class processor and how much memory um, these machines had. So that was the that was another option, um, and then you know um, I found this um, subreddit uh, about OpenSense, and then when you go down that rabbit hole, um, there's all kinds of other suggestions that that people had in terms of you know uh, what you could do. So one of the other popular options is to uh, buy a used um, slim PC or or a thin client, um, and some of them have um, an open PCIe slot. So, um, um, you know, these are, these are the, the, you know, thin client ones um, and you can see them in libraries and places like that. Um, and so you can buy the used ones, uh, you know, off eBay, um, add, a, add a four port NIC, as you see in this picture here. Uh, and, um, you know, typically they have a very limited amount of storage. So you can either um, add a larger disk or use um, like an external USB drive uh, for storage. Um, these things uh, with the NIC uh, tend to draw about 30 watts. So similar to the uh, to those built boxes that we saw before. Um, and then um, it's about $200 to get this whole thing. Of course, the prices vary wildly from time to time. So. Um, if you want to go down this, uh, you need to have some patience because um, the, these are somewhat hard to get um, at reasonable prices. <clears throat> um, so then, you know, as you as you go down all of these um, um, subreddits, you 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 find people doing all kinds of other crazy stuff. So then, you know, one of the ideas: why don't we just get a you know, one new rack mount server with a bunch of ethernet ports. And as I was uh, looking for these things, um, this is what I found. So uh, this is uh, a machine called the Kemp Loadmaster 3400. And it's actually meant to be a, a, a load balancer, uh, a web front end. Um, and uh, the this is a this is one new, but it is a, a limited depth. It's not very deep uh, as compared to a standard one new um, rack mount server. Uh, so uh, you know this kind of looked looked interesting. Um, it has um, eight uh, gigabit Ethernet ports um, on the front, uh, two USB 2.0 um, slots. And a Cisco style, you know, serial port with you know the RJ45 jack. Uh, and on the back, um, it has a VGA port, 
and a couple more USB ports and then the power. Um, inside, um, okay, inside, um, you know, this is a picture, it's not great, uh, but uh, you know, you can see sort of the, the power supply here on the, on the bottom right uh, under this heat sink um, is the, is the, is a CPU, a um, couple of sticks of RAM. Uh, and then up here, you see the eight uh, files for the, for the ethernet controllers. Uh, uh, and then, you know, a couple of SATA ports for the, for the disc. So pretty, pretty basic um, um, server board. <clears throat> And again, I apologize for this picture, but um, this is the BIOS uh, menu. It shows it's a, a four core um, Sandy Bridge um, Xeon. Um, so this is from, I, I think it is 2011 or 2012, somewhat of that vintage. And um, it has um, eight gigabytes of DDR3 RAM. Um, so this is pretty interesting and uh, I paid. Fifty-three dollars and eleven cents uh, for for this. Uh, uh, it didn't come with any disc, uh, but uh, you know I had a bunch of spare ones uh, lying around. Uh, Two point five inch, you know, laptop drive. Um, I didn't want to put a SSD in because I know there will be a lot of log writes, and I didn't want to kill the thing. Plus, I had a few, like I said, a spare. Um, discs, um, the regular spinning rust discs anyway. So I went ahead and used those. Um, <clears throat> so I got that um, and, you know, OpenSense um, installed really without a problem. Uh, just put that on, on a USB, you know, thumb drive and then booted it up and it all just worked um, perfectly. All the eight um, uh, gigabit ethernet ports got recognized. Um, and it loads these drivers for EM, so the and the ports get labeled um, EM zero through EM seven. Uh, because I wanted to go for the overkill, <laughs> I, I um, uh, once I configured one port as LAN, uh, as for the WAN, um, I link aggregated two uh, ports to the to my main switch um, for the for the two LAN ports. Uh, and then uh, I had, uh, uh, so I separately got a um, couple of um, uh, uh, special, like so separate um, uh, wireless access points. Um, and then I set up uh, uh, three VLANs and then mapped this both to the hardwired network on the, on the switches, as well as to Wi-Fi, you know, the SSIDs. So I have one internal network um, that is for my NAS and, and my desktop. And then I have a, I have a devices LAN, which uh, basically has most of the devices at home, um, you know, all our phones, printer, you know, internet streaming devices, uh, game consoles, all that stuff gets put on the device network. Uh, and then um, there's a third one for guests, you know, my kids' friends come over and they want to play uh, or use the internet, then they get, they get the guest network. So um, the um, um, devices on the internal network can access uh, stuff on the devices network, but not vice versa. The only exception is, um, for certain devices that need access to files on the NAS, and just that one port is open for those specific devices. So that's how I kind of segmented my my network, and then I configured uh, WireGuard for for remote access. So I have uh, WireGuard clients on my laptops as well as phones, and so if I need to get to some file in the NAS, for example. Um, I can VPN in through WireGuard and access it that way. So, you know, relatively simple setup, but, um, but um, seems to be working for us. Um, this is, you know, crude picture of kind of what the, what the network um, looks like. Um, 
So the, uh, you know, uh, have a cable modem connected out to the internet, um, feeds into this OpenSense router. And then there are uh, these two link aggregated connections going over to uh, live streaming is on. Okay, I'll set. Okay. Wait, why did this go here? Sorry, lost my. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was saying um, the the um, um, these two links get get link aggregated. Not so much for bandwidth, just you know because I could do it. Um, I, I did that, and then I have two. Um, oh, we lost uh, the bandwidth. Oh, it's back again. Is everything okay? Yeah, it's back again. Okay. All right. Um, so um, I have uh, two. Um, uh, separate access points, both connected over those um, Cat6 cables that we laid, um, and um, they're both uh, they're both ceiling mounted, and um, one on each floor, and kind of one is placed closer to the front of the house, and one closer to the back of the house, so kind of staggered. Uh, and then you know I have I have uh, uh, other Ethernet cables connecting to these different devices. And then a bunch of other things connected over the over the Wi-Fi, so um, uh, seems to be working great so far. <clears throat> and you know, a couple of screenshots here of of uh, of the installation process. You know, once when you when you boot in uh, with the thumb drive, you get this get this prompt, and you know, looks like a typical. You know Debian or you know that kind of install process. You can just either do like a live um, um, live boot and then test it out, or you can go ahead and and install it um, like that. And um, uh, you know this is the this is the console, and you can see the the network interfaces, and then you have a bunch of um, uh, menu prompts for. Um, for uh, what you uh, um, uh, want to, you know, want to do, right? Uh, there's a question about what wireless access points. Um, so I bought a couple of Ubiquity um, um, access points, <clears throat> uh, and there are like um, you can mount them on the on the on the on a wall or or the or the ceiling. So I had them mounted on the ceiling, and I had made sure to have um, network drops um, over there. And the nice thing about that is that um, those um, uh, those access points are are uh, power over Ethernet. So my switch um, pro has a, a, a few uh, ports that can provide that uh, power over Ethernet. So I didn't need um, separate um, uh, you know, electrical like power supply to the to the um, uh, to the access points. So um, just everything gets powered by the by the switch. And you know, here's a here's a throwback um, XKCD. Uh, you know, <laughs> about having to boot BSD. Uh, thankfully, I didn't have any such problems. Um, it just worked. Uh, and uh, wanted to do some um, some performance. So um, in here, I have um, two different machines connected. I think when I did this test, they were connected to uh, two of the Ethernet ports directly on the router. Um, I also did this experiment with um, uh, um, you know going through the switch, and then uh, you know through through iperf, you can verify that both. Um, Upstream and, and downstream connections, I could I could get to um, about 930 megabits, which is about the limit for for a gigabit Ethernet connection. So I was I was getting full bandwidth um, simultaneously duplex um, over this. In theory, because I, I uh, link aggregated uh, those, I could get higher speed, but I don't have any um, single machine that can. Um, do more than gigabit Ethernet, so I don't have I don't have uh, 
2.5 gig or 10 gig NICs on any of my machines. So, and then the switch is a, a gigabit switch anyway. Um, so um, I could get you know more, but I, I, I don't have a way to get there. Um, so this was just uh, within my home network. And then um, I also did uh, kind of the standard uh, speed test, uh, both over the wired network and over Wi-Fi. And I'm getting close to, or slightly higher uh, than the sort of the, the um, internet tier that I have from my ISP. So um, um, the Wi-Fi works better in uh, the same room. If I am one room away, it kind of drops uh, by 15, 20% but it's not too bad. So um, kind of everything, uh, once, once everything was set up, um, performance seemed to be okay. Um, and today, oddly, is the first time I've had bandwidth problems. Or it um, may not be, with, with Jitsi, it may not be you. Maybe, I don't know. Um, and then I hadn't really done a whole lot of power measurements, but uh, you know when I was talking about this, like uh, Brian DeLacy, he uh, he poked me and said, "Hey, how much? What about the power?" And then that motivated me to um, bust out my kilowatt meter and then um, do some do some um, power measurements. So you know this is uh, this is a, a rack mount server. It's not designed to be lower power so once once i plugged um uh my modem the, the cable modem the router and the switch um um and i just left it there for a couple of days and um it measured an average of about 89 watts and this includes the power over ethernet supplied to the the two the, the two access points uh the router alone averaged about 65 watts um so much this is you know double than what you could get out of those uh you know more custom made machines uh so uh actually just a couple of days ago um i looked into um what could be done um in terms of tweaking the the cpu power management in open sense uh and uh from uh from 65 watts, I could get it down to 53 watts, bringing the, the total power um, over another two-day period uh, from 89 watts on average to 77 watts on average. Um, not big, but at but at today's electricity prices, like anything is is good. Uh, so the kind of changes I made was to uh, lower the CPU frequency down to 1600 megahertz. Um, uh, this was uh, adaptive um, earlier, and so I don't think this helped a whole lot. Maybe saved um, a small amount, but the but the bigger one uh, was to enable the CPUs to go down to a CPI C3 state, which is a much lower power state uh, when the CPU cores are idle. Um, uh, by default. Um, that um, so these things at the at the bottom you can see these these um, settings. Um, uh, Open Sense calls them tunables, and um, the the frequency levels um, the way it represents them are you know this is the frequency slash uh, the power. So this ninety five thousand is ninety five watts. Uh, so this is coded in terms of milliwatts, uh, and you can see it's it's the the TDP um, on Intel's website for this chip does list it as 95 watts average. But if, if you go uh, boost, it, you know, this 3101 is, is not really a frequency, but it's, it represents the boost state. Um, and it can go even higher than 95 uh, watts, but for relatively small periods of time. Uh, uh, and then if you go all the way down to 1600, it, it stays fixed at, at about 40.5 watts. Um, with the adaptive setting, uh, it didn't really um, go to these higher frequencies very often. Um, occasionally it would do, uh, but now I'm basically forcing it to stick um, to this level, uh, which is this frequency setting.
And then in terms of the CX state supported, um, it listed C1, C2, and C3. But by default, the, the lowest C state that it was allowed to go to was only C1. Um, so uh, what it shows here is C1, um, um, it takes about one um, millisecond to enter and exit C1 state, 80 milliseconds for C2 and 104 milliseconds for, for um, C3. So um, there is obviously a cost involved in going to these deeper, deeper states. And I wasn't sure how well the system would work um, if, um, if uh, uh, C3 was enabled, if this 104 milliseconds was going to be a problem uh, when some you know, big demand showed up. Um, thankfully, it uh, hasn't been a problem. Um, I have, uh, like I said, it's only been three or four days since I've um, done this. And so far, uh, hasn't I haven't experienced any problems. So this, I think, uh, this C3 state is saving me most of those 12 watts that that I gained um, from 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 this. In which case, is the potential pain of not having adaptive CPU um, for surges um, not worth it? Should, should you go back to adaptive CPU? That's what I'm wondering. I have to go back and measure. If I go go set the frequency back to adaptive, um, and you know maybe maybe it's just half a watt or something that that might be, and then I might I might get better performance. I I just left it here for now, Bill, um, just to kind of see if we have any if I have any problems. But you're right. Maybe understood. Mm -hmm, maybe adaptive is the is a better way to go. Um, I mean, adaptive would probably help you work off the 104 millisecond latency on waking up. That's true. Um, the other thing um, somebody suggested was to say to leave. Uh, so this this machine has four cores. So I could leave one core at C1. Like I can say so. So these settings here, like it's you know you dev CPU dot zero. So that's CPU zero. I only showed CPU zero here, but basically I have it set for zero, one, two, and three. Um, but one of the um, suggestions was that, uh, let's say for CPU zero, you say the, the lowest is C1, and then the other three CPUs can go to C3. Um, so maybe that's um, another option. Um, to, if you So if there is a, a, a certain demand, then the CPU zero can, quickly exit the C state and, and handle that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but yeah, um, I, I, I haven't fiddled with it more. I don't know if there's some more savings to be had. Um, the other thing I found is the, 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 the CPU fan, the system fans don't really spin down. Um, this seems to be going at a constant speed. I haven't played around with the BIOS to see if there is some adaptive fan speed control. Um, this this thing is sitting in my basement, so um, the noise and other things don't bother anybody else. So I haven't. If it was sitting here next to me, I would have been more motivated to go take a look. But it's um, out of sight. Um, <clears throat> I think that was my. My last slide. I can um, go to the demo, maybe quickly. Um, are there any questions before I go there? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Um, so let me switch to... Um, Actually, one thing I was wondering, um... You got, that, you got that load balancing device. Uh, was that on eBay? I remember you said it was like $51. That was 50 bucks on eBay about a year ago. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, there are, there are um, other models of this. Like there's a 2200, which I think is a little bit older. And then there is a 30... 600 and um, something else. Um, but actually there are a bunch of devices like this. There are, uh, you know, other people have taken um, like um, 
firewalls from Sophos, um, a lot of them are x86 cores on the inside. Um, similarly, there is like a, 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 a lot of them are um, standard like 1U super micro boards. Um, so, and different people are basically like just rebadging them. So you can uh, you can go and find a bunch of different of these um, load balancers and um, you know firewalls and things like this, which uh, um, costs a lot if you want to get the um, original license for those things. So so when I got this, they had removed the disk because the disk had the um, original load balancer software and the license for it. No. Without that, the machine was obviously worth a lot less. So you basically use it as is, other than adding hard drive, right? You didn't have to replace the motherboard or anything. Nope, nope, nothing. Okay. So uh, I got it as is. The, the and they even sent the power cord and the and the serial cable. I didn't even have to get those. Um, and uh, yeah, I just I just had a um, uh, an old uh, you know um, I think it was like a um, five hundred gig. Um, 2.5 inch disc, and I just stuck that in there. Okay, uh, let me go over to the demo portion. Um, so um, this is Proxmox. Um, I don't know if um, anyone here has used it before, but it's basically uh, uh, a layer on top of the standard KVM um, hypervisor. Um, and it's meant to mimic some of the things that you get out of VMware ESXi and, and things like that. So uh, basically you install uh, Proxmox on your machine. And then if you go to the um, particular uh, web address, you get, um, you get the options to set it up. So this is the, this is the, the host. Um, uh, and then it shows you the VMs that, that you install. So um, I think I originally set this up to test some different Debian images. Um, I deleted all of them and then um, I have OpenSense um, as the only VM at the moment. Um, but, um, you know, you can, you can um, I, this is the first time I used OpenSense and I was, again, very surprised at how how easy it was to set up. You could follow a couple of quick tutorials on how it's how it's done. But basically, you um, you know you go to the local instance. You know you can upload whatever ISO images you want, and then VM disks, and then you can go install um, install this. So um, um, I got OpenSense um, uh, as the only VM here. And you can go to the hardware section here and then um, select what you want to do. So if you want to go to processors, um, like click edit here, I can, I can decide how many cores I want to um, allocate and then sort of compute, you know, units. If I want to limit uh, this uh, to have lower priority, I could go change this. And then some of the other options here sort of the only thing that I enabled was um, AES for the hardware acceleration. Um, similarly, you can you can um, add the network devices. So I am actually running this on an old um, laptop, um, and it has only one um, uh, you know built-in NIC port. But I added a USB um, device. So I think if I went. Here, yeah, here under network, you can see that I have the built-in um, LAN, uh, which is this ENP1 F0, and then this one is my uh, USB uh, NIC adapter. Um, I, I created two bridges, uh, one that connects. It's it's only one port per bridge. I don't have to do this, but it's easier if you do it. So the built-in one is basically my LAN, and um, the uh, other one, the USB one, I pass through to the to the VM, and that acts as the that's you know my WAN port in quotes. Uh, so that's that's basically all there is. So uh, you know you you configure this, you install um, install OpenSense over there, and and off you go. 
Um, so once uh, Open Sense is installed, you can go to that uh, and you configure it, uh, the basic LAN address. You are greeted with, uh, with this um, login prompt. So if I uh, type that in, um, it takes me, um, it'll take you to this, this lobby screen by default. And this kind of shows you um, what the what the network um, looks like. So um, you know here it's showing that it is two KVM cores that I that I allocated. Um, I gave it I think yeah I I gave it three gigabytes of of memory and some amount of disk um, sixty four gigs in this case. As you can see, it's not using very much uh, very small amount of disk space. Uh, these are my interfaces, LAN and WAN. Since these are uh, virtual um, adapters, it shows up as 10 gig, but it's obviously not 10 gig. It's only a gigabit um, Ethernet. And you can see the, the addresses. So this is the internal LAN address of this device, and, and this is the, the WAN address. And this is what my real OpenSense firewall uh, gives me. Uh, and you know you can enable some of these widgets. Uh, you can go here and um, um, select if you want to do other kinds of. So I can add a traffic graph if I if I want. To. Um, it'll it'll show traffic through this through the system. So it's it's pretty quick um, dashboard to to uh, give you an idea of what is what is happening. Um, and then, oh, one thing I forgot to show, right? in, in um, Proxmox, um, you can go and access the console um, uh, of, of, the, of both the host as well as the VM. So I can go here and I can do shell, and you know, this opens a, a root shell on the, on the Proxmox um, uh, sort of base uh, OS, and I can... Um, I can also go to the particular VM instance, uh, click on console, and you know I see the OpenSense um, console. So after it booted, you're, you're greeted with this with this screen. So it shows you your your interfaces and you know your SSH signatures and so forth. So um, you can do you know I can log into um, the 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 console. Um, here and it shows you it's it gets you to this this menu which is the screenshot that I pasted in my in my slides and then you can you can do different things uh, right right from here um, but uh, you know configuring it is is a lot easier uh, from the from the from the GUI. Um, so um, the the menu is pretty nicely laid out on the left here. So if you go to reporting and and traffic, um, you can see the same graph that you could have enabled as the widget in the in the initial one. So this shows you what what traffic is going. You know, and here I only have two interfaces, but in my um, if you have other like virtual LANs or or other ports, you can you can enable or disable um, those ones, and then it kind of shows you what IP addresses or or addresses are being used. So uh, this uh, this network is currently talking to these various um, um, you know addresses. So this this is kind of the summary, um, and then. If you uh, go down to system, um, you know under access you can you can you know right now only the root um, user is set up. If you want, you can add another normal user or or another sysadmin uh, account. You can you can add those um, under configuration. You know this is kind of a nice thing. Um, you can download so the current configuration as an XML file and save that off. Uh, and then later on, you could wipe your whole OpenSense installation, reinstall it, and then you can load that same config file and restore the config. It's it's pretty simple. I tried it; it actually works. Uh, 
they also have an option if you want to, uh, if you choose to do it, you can have automatic backups enabled through your Google Drive. I think you can, there's also other plugins um, that you can get uh, that can um, back up to like a next cloud instance or some other cloud storage, Amazon S3 and so forth. So you can you can get some plugins that can that can do that. But this is like a very easy thing to to do. So periodically you can just save the config. So what I do is I don't have automatic backups, but um, I make it a point before I make any changes to save off um, the uh, working config. Um, and then if I mess something up, I just go and, and restore the, the, the last known good one. Uh, then if you go under firmware uh, and status, um, you can see um, which version it is. Uh, and now I, I purposely didn't update this one just to kind of show you how easy it is. You can say check for updates. Um, and then it's fetching um, these things and says this many this many packages to 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 you know have updates and it shows you a summary here of uh, what all um, uh, deltas there are since the since the since the previous one. So it's it's very easy to kind of see what is what is. Um, been upgraded since your last change, and then you can decide if you want to do it. And it also will tell you um, uh, if uh, whether or not, and and uh, here, so it will it'll tell you whether or not this requires a reboot, which I think is 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 uh, very helpful because I don't want to do this uh, because it'll automatically if you enable it, it'll automatically reboot, and I don't want to do this at a time when others might be on the network. So I can, I generally do this, um, you know, some evening when the rest of my family is already in bed. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, and then if you, if you actually go here, you can see all the different packages that are available, which ones are installed, which one you could install, and then all the different um, plugins. So, um, uh, uh, you know, there's there's a whole bunch. Um, some of them are are from the WireGuard, sorry, the OpenSense folks itself, and others are third party. So you know, WireGuard actually comes in as a as a as a as a plugin. Uh, I found it. I found it. I mean, it has everything. Um, at least I was interested in finding um, either as a package or as a as a as a plugin. So, um, and yeah, this shows you all the different versions that I've released and it shows you I'm at a really, really old version and there's a bunch of updates that happened since then. So um, the, the OpenSense itself gets updated twice a year, you know, similar to um, Ubuntu. Uh, so there's one in January and there's one in um, July. Um, so this is the 22.7, which is uh, July of this year. So next month, there'll be a 23.1 release. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to show? So, um, so we should go check and see which um, uh, security bug fixes you failed to install, huh? This is my, yeah, my, my actual external facing one is up to date. I, I did that. Uh, okay. Actually, no, I am one, one version behind. I'm 7.9. Uh, I haven't got the 10 that just got released today. So I have not applied this latest. Just, just released today is fair. I I think <laughs> yeah. it's sweet and cute that you think nobody uses Wi-Fi in bed. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I generally have to get permissions uh, to make sure, hey, network is going to go down for whatever two minutes or whatever it takes to, to reboot. I, I don't bother with permission if... Uh... If the Le router, needs, and if the router needs rebooting, it's probably bad for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, it's 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 uh, you can just come here and see if there's anything new that you need to apply. And I I w what I don't know is whether 
um, you can automatically do this if you so choose. Uh, I haven't found that that setting. Um, maybe there is somewhere in which you can say automatically download and, and update, don't ask me, which may be a good or bad thing, depending. Um, and then, uh, okay, what else did I want to talk about? Okay, if we go down to, um, if we go down to settings, um, administration, um, you can choose to have it. This is all internal. You don't, you don't, you, by default, nothing is allowed. So, so only sort of traffic going out to the WAN is, is allowed. So it has, it has, I found it has very, very good sane, um, defaults and it defaults to actually even the web GUI here defaulting to, um, HTTPS, um, you could use the like the built-in like private certificate or you know if you really want to go out and and do um set up a domain and do that let let's encrypt you can go off and, and do all that um um secure shell um is disabled by default i enabled it uh, just because i wanted to um, log in and do some things um obviously very bad idea if you're doing this externally to permit group login and password login so on my on my um, um, actual firewall, these are all disabled. I have SSH enabled, um, but it's only via via a key, and it's not um, not on the WAN. Only through LAN. Um, if I have to come in through the WAN, I have to go through WireGuard uh, VPN. Um, and then, yeah, you can select whether you want VGA console or you want to go through serial console for, for access. Uh, and then uh, under uh, general, um, these are some of the basic settings, uh, you know, host name, time zone, DNS server, um, you can set up um, Set up all of these. Um, I just picked quad nine. Uh, and under uh, um, um, miscellaneous, uh, you this is the power D. Um, so this is the power demon, and this is what was uh, was there before. Um, uh, I had it at adaptive. And if you just set it to minimum, it'll go to the minimum frequency, which is what I did on my machine. But by, by default, it is high adaptive, which means it will, um, um, uh, by default, it won't go to the lowest frequency, but something higher than that. And, but it's still adaptive as in it can, it can go, um, go to the fastest frequency. I think that was the, main thing here and then here under tunables are are various like you know network parameters and vm uh, virtual memory parameters and you can add or uh, remove some things so i use this to basically um set the the minimum um, um c state to c3 for all the cpu so you can simply go add and put the the parameter name and the value in a, in a description um, pretty straightforward. And the first time you log in actually takes you to this wizard. I'm not going to go through this now, but it's, you know, this is where you can set the basic um, um, DNS servers and DHCP range and things like this. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty easy. Um, all right. So then we come down to interfaces. This is where things get interesting. Um, under under overview, it shows you all the different interfaces that I have. I do not know what these mean, but this is obviously loopback. And then our two um, two interfaces uh, that I mapped to the LAN and the and the WAN. Um, if you go to the the LAN port, um, you can say you can enable. And then um, this is where, like for example, if I go on to the um, WAN port, by default it blocks. Um, any private networks and any bolt-on network. So anything that is not assigned, 
um, is is blocked by by default. Uh, and this list of what is uh, what are unassigned IPs, at least in the IPv4 space, I don't think there's anything left here unassigned. But but generally, any ranges that are not assigned um, are blocked. And I think this goes off, and um, there's a cron job to go refresh this list every 48 hours or something. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the, the what the frequency is. Um, but again, this is this is a case of you know same defaults uh, being being applied. And you can set the, the the DHCP configuration if you wanted to for the for the WAN port. Um, it's it's um, set to DHCP. You can set it to static if you have a static IP on your WAN. On the LAN, um, um, it's similar. So the LAN gets a static IP address, and you can you can set up, set that up. Your net mask, um, and so forth. Um, and then here in the assignments tab is where you you designate which interface is what uh, what uh, port. So you can pick um, you know these are the two available network interfaces. And you can assign LAN or WAN, and if you want, you can create more um, here. And then, if you come down to the other types, is where um, you can do things like um, the link aggregation and and VLAN. So, if you want to create a, a new VLAN, you go here, and you can describe your your device, and you can say what is going to be the parent. So, set that to LAN, and then you can put the VLAN tag and and all of this. So this is what I used in my in my actual router to create those three VLANs that I talked about. And the parent of all those interfaces is the LAN port. Uh, and then we come to the firewall. Um, so uh, under I'm trying to look at my notes here, make sure I covered the most important things. Um, okay, so under under NAT, you have port forward. So if you want to uh, forward external ports to um, some internal port on an internal IP, you can go you can go do that. By default, it adds this rule so that it allows uh, you know SSH and and um, HTTP um, to access the the router itself. So this it calls it the anti lockout rule. So that you don't disable this and somehow get locked out of your firewall. Um, of course, if you did do that, you can always um, you can always go through the you'll you'll have to go through the console or the or the serial, and then and then reset that if you did manage to mess this up. And then um, under rules, this is where it gets interesting. Um, you have your LAN, and by default, anything on the LAN is allowed to um, go go out, um, and if you go on the WAN, uh, basically nothing is is um, enabled. So these default set of rules are all those things that that I mentioned. So all private networks are 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 blocked. Um, all this list of bogons, which is basically an alias that um, already exists, and if you want, so if you want to create other aliases, you can do that too under the under the aliases tab um, here. Um, but um, these are all same defaults. And I just here have a have a rule um, uh, just to show you how easy it is to create one. Um, so action is pass, or you can say block or, or reject. Uh, um, enable this rule. Um, um, on the interface uh, when, direction in, if it's IPv4, um, any source, um, the destination is this firewall address. So that can be either the WAN um, uh, address or one of the LAN addresses. And if the port is um, SSH, I want to allow. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I can, I can, uh, this is this is just so that if you want to come in over the WAN over SSH, you can you can allow this um, rule. Um, obviously, it may not be a good idea to do it, but this is just to show you how a rule is constructed. 
And same thing you can say, you know, like in my case, I wanted, um, um, you know, my, my desktop, which is on my internal um, VLAN um, to access, uh, uh, you know, things that are on my other devices LAN. So then I can add a rule that says if the inbound port is on uh, from my internal VLAN and the destination is the um, uh, devices VLAN, then allow that traffic in. But then I, in my in my um, devices VLAN, I only allow those devices to talk to the LAN and nothing else. Uh, so you can you can basically enable. Um, these uh, these uh, these rules and there's some things called floating rules which apply to all interfaces by by default so you know a lot of these like allow ping and things like this um, there are some things that are that are enabled by 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 default and and the SSH lockout rules these apply to apply to all interfaces um, so I think that's the kind of um, major things about uh, oh yeah so so under um log files um you can go to live view and this is showing all the activity that is um, happening and if you want to filter you can go filter so i only want to see uh, things that are getting blocked so i can just add that row and now it's only showing things that are that are being blocked and this is um, things that, you know, external um, things are trying to come in, these are all getting blocked both on V4 and, and V6. So these are some other devices in my network trying to get, you know, send broadcast packets or, or like, um, you know, other UDP requests that are now getting, getting blocked. So um, you can you can log them um, and you can you can save these off. Like if you have a particular rule set, um, you can save off that that rule set, and then you can load that again um, later. So it's it's pretty flexible that way. Um, what else? So so next is you know VPN. So by default, it only comes with IPsec and OpenVPN. But like I showed you, if you go on to the plugins um, thing and then um, install the WireGuard plugin, you'll see another entry here for, for WireGuard. Um, and then there's a, there's a whole bunch of settings to configure um, e any of these VPNs if you choose to. And when you, when you add uh, a VPN, then if you go back to the interfaces tab, there'll be another, another interface that is created, a virtual interface that is created for that um, particular um, VPN um, interface. And then you can go click onto that and then you, you can set up the rules um, for, for that um, nice. separate rule. Uh, so you can say, so for, for example, you can say anything that's coming over the VPN is only allowed to talk to this subnet or, or traffic and go out back to the WAN. So um, like if you're in a coffee shop and you just, you want to, uh, basically tunnel all your traffic through your home router, you could choose to do it that way. The other things that you can set up with the VPN is if you have, um, you know, uh, things like zero tier or tail scale, one of these kind of peer to peer VPNs. Um, so you can join all your devices in a network. Um, you can set it up that way. Um, Cloudflare tunnels, like all kinds of things you can enable it that way. Um, um, if you choose to. So it's it's very flexible. So once you have that interface defined, you'll see, um, you know, under uh, rules, uh, you'll see the same thing. You'll see that WireGuard or OpenVPN interface, and then you can configure specific um, uh, DHCP ranges and specific uh, firewall rules um, for, uh, for any traffic coming over that interface. Um, the last kind of subgroup here is is um, is services, and you go under DHCP uh, v4, and then here you see um, all the um, DHCP settings for for this particular LAN um, interface. So some of this is set up in the in that wizard itself, but then you can always come here and modify it. So you can specify 
what range of DHCP addresses you want to specify. And then if you want to, if you want to override the overall DNS settings for this interface, you can say you can provide your own um, uh, VLAN or, or like interface specific um, DNS um, servers and gateway. Uh, and you can click here and you can see the, the leases. So this, um, this is this, this laptop connected uh, uh, over here. Um, to, to, to this, um, uh, that's the only uh, um, IP address that's, that's configured. And if I want to change this to a static address, I can just go here, click on this um, plus, and you know, it automatically the MAC address, and then I can specify what static um, IP address I want to assign uh, to this device. So then from then on, um, um, this laptop can be configured to get the same fixed IP address. Um, even though on the laptop side, you can still configure it as, as DHCP, uh, but, uh, but OpenSense will hand out the same DHCP address each time that device connects. Uh, that's about DHCP. Um, and the other thing I wanted to cover was um, DNS, so it comes with the unbound um, DNS server. Uh, you can you can enable that. If you want DNS sec support, you can configure that. Um, pretty easy to do. I did that, um, um, and it's 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 very easy. Um, and then you can go here on under um, block lists, and then you have a. Um, DNS blacklist. So you can you can go here. There's a bunch of pre-configured um, uh, lists that you can you can enable. So if I if I want to just disable Facebook, I go do that. Or any of these you know ads or trackers, those kinds of um, you know privacy kind of things. So this simple tracker, for example, blocks any of these web cookie sites and trackers like that. So you can you can go enable this. Um, this is not as flexible or um, you know um, easy to configure, like something like a pie hole. If you wanted to do network wide ad blocking, it's it's fairly decent, but I don't think it's as easy to use as uh, as a pie hole. Uh, I previously did have a pie hole and I got rid of it. Um, partially because that Raspberry Pi um, died <laughs> and I haven't had time to look at why. Uh, but this thing seems to be working reasonably enough in terms of keeping the really nasty bits out of my network. Uh, but but if you wanted to have a separate um, pie hole instance, um, there are various tutorials on how you can do that. So you can have um, here unbound DNS basically Forward the query over to a pie hole and get the response back. So you can you can set it up that way if you choose to. But and then and then there are some plugins that can do more advanced. Uh, so there is a there is a plugin called um, Zen Armor. Uh, if I go, um, uh, what is Maybe it's a package. Uh, I think it's a package. Uh, I forgot where it is. Um, but basically, um, there's there's a package called Zen Armor, which is what they call the next gen firewall, and it can do more detailed. Um, you know, content blocking. Um, um, if you wanted to, you know, let's say prevent. Um, uh, I want to prevent my kid from watching YouTube between 9 p.m. and you know 6 a.m. Then I could set it up that way. It's more more granular. Um, uh, you know, access management um, uh, that's possible. I I can't now find where it is, but it's it's somewhere here. Um, and then there is um, uh, 
if you want to do more kind of intrusion detection and intrusion prevention, um, um, they use uh, this. This is the default one, which is Suricarda, and you can you can set that up um, if you want to do um, detect threats or things from uh, primarily from inside your network. If you have inside, you can you can set it up to try and monitor that and and stop those things. I think that is most of what I wanted to cover. Any other questions, either about my choice of uh, network, you know, or whether some questions about, about OpenSense itself? Well, it looks pretty impressive. Yeah, I think it looks like a very nice system. Yeah, I, I, I've been very pleasantly surprised um, how well um, it works and how easy it is to, to play around. And like I said, if you mess something up, just make sure you save save off your config um, at the beginning before you play around with things. And then if you really screwed up, you can just go back, um, restore the, the the good state, and then you're, you're up and running again. Mm -hmm. So what a lot of people do is um, have a separate, you know, if you if you have more than two NICs on your on your machine, um, you set one as LAN, one as WAN, and then the third one as a management port. So you could connect um, through there, and you configure that management interface to have carte blanche um, access to everything inside. So if you mess something up, you can just go connect your um, uh, as long as you didn't screw up the management interface itself, um, you can um, plug in your um, laptop or desktop into that management port and then access the UI and, and um, restore to the last known good state. So that's kind of a um, best practice um, that a lot of people do. And since I have, you know, eight... Um, Ports, I could, I did that. So I have a, I have a dedicated um, management port on my, on my router. Hmm. Any other questions? No, doesn't seem like it. I think it was a great talk. I really appreciated it. Thank you. I think you, I think the amount of uh, investigation you made into the different operating systems and stuff and different distributions was very helpful. Thanks. And yeah. you know, to to your talk, uh, I guess it was a couple of years ago, Mad Dog, um, um, about people buying you know, systems and not buying, you know, hardware or software, they want solutions, right? Uh, you know, if you go and buy one of those pre-built things, you get everything uh, pre-configured. So if you are not inclined to um, install all of this, or if you want, you know, commercial support, you can buy one of those devices and they come with the support. Um, but even if you go the DIY route, um, it, it was fairly easy, um, even, even for, you know, I don't claim to be a network expert of, of any sort. Um, I know basics of how TCP IP works, uh, but I was able to um, that you know get it working relatively quickly. You know, what I always done in the past, uh, well, I still do now. It's uh, I just basically buy an off-the-shelf uh, uh, Wi-Fi router. And I disable DHCP on the Wi-Fi router and run an internal DHCP server uh, in my head. And that way, I get more flexibility. That was, that was the single biggest limitation I found on the uh, in the off-the-shelf router. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Well, thanks, Shankar. It was a great meeting. Thank you. It was great. Thanks. I enjoyed it.
And if you have any questions, you feel free to email me. It's on the, my email is on the BLU site. So. Yep. Oh, it just occurred to me. I, I forgot to post something on IRC to let people know about the live stream. I usually do that at the beginning of the meeting every month. But it slipped my mind the same. Just in case I don't see you guys again uh, before the holidays end, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Yep, same, yep. same to you. Same to you. And Happy Hanukkah to those who uh, appreciate that. That too. Of course. And over at Kwanzaa and Diwali. I don't know if anyone uh, in this chat. Uh, we, we've so got well, some Diwali's already traditions over. in this house for tonight. Yep. Okay, I'm going to stop the live stream.